the football's always been in your blood. Can you tell us about, about your early days at Emmerkeen High School? And I played long, played uh, football long before I went to Emmerkeen. Uh, I went to, to Aberdour Primary, but I mean, I can even remember kicking a ball about before I went to <laughs> for a started school. So, uh, yeah, we just every time I had a chance, I was you know, down the local park kicking a ball about and played. Yeah. As I say, I played football at Aberdour Primary and also at Emmerkeen. I mean, you played a lot for Hearts. You cost yourselves a jumble. I, well, yeah, of course you don't spend so much time at a club without having a lot of affection for it. But you no, know, initially you had a lot of people in, in, in here, and you need to keep this quiet. But yeah, initially I was a Wraith Rovers supporter. That's you not know. bad, is it? <laughs> <laughs> it could be worse. It could be worse than that, I'll tell you. Oh, you no, I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> well, it's interesting you see that because I remember like, a comment made when, uh, when Gordon Brown had seemingly put a wee bit of money into the Rovers and they tried to, the press tried to fire up a wee bit further this Dunfermline versus Kirkcaldy thing and, and it just didn't fell flat in his face because I know there's a lot of mutual respect and there's a bit of banter but there's no any any hatred as such you know I've seen you know but so how did you actually get hooked on football did you did you watch the no, telly just, one yeah night, I, I, I remember as a, as a kid you know uh, yeah when in those days it wasn't it wasn't like it is just now where you know the football's on the telly nearly 24 7 but Aye. you know when I was growing up there was you know the occasional game on the television midweek maybe some European mm-hmm. matches and I remember being so young as four or five year old and um, asking my mum if I could stay up late to you know to watch the, the football. So I've, I've always you know I've always been interested in what my brothers played and um, you know, we're always kicking a ball about, we're always outside. Right. And uh, I just I don't know, I can't remember, you know, the first what, what got me hooked, but I can I, I can always just remember being you know, being mad keen okay. in football. So what kind of opportunities do you think are available to, to young footballers these days to, um you know, getting into the game and um, is it well, as easy as it used to be or I think it probably is and I, but I'm not so sure that kids are as hungry and, and determined and you know um, driven as, as we were as kids you know I think it's more to do with society and so many other options available for, for a lot of kids these days but I mean I don't know about you but when I was a kid we played football or we ran about outside and Aye. You know, occasionally yeah. go into trouble doing things we shouldn't do. <laughs> exactly, that's the point of bringing up, <laughs> eh? You, you played for Hearts for about 15 years. What, are you any real fond memories of your time in oh, the Hearts? You must have had Far it. too many memories. I, mean, I met a, a lot of good people there, you know, and you spend so much time. I was there as a player from uh, nine, uh, sorry, 1983 till 97. And then I left to go to Cowdenbeath, uh, well, sorry, Livingston for Rivella in Cowdenbeath. And I was back at Hearts 2000 and left in 2004. So. That's 18 years in total that I've, I've been at the club, you know, and I've got really, really fond memories. And I met a lot of good people and, and still a lot of good friends that I met uh, through Hearts. But, you know, loads, of, loads and loads of great memories on the field. Any stories you shouldn't tell us? Well, the fact <laughs> that I shouldn't tell you, I'll not be telling you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oops. What a try now, eh? When you finished playing, how did you get on with the transition? You know, being every day sort of putting boots on and running about, going to transition into management and things. Well, yeah. it, it was kind of forced on me. You know, I, I finished, I, didn't, I played my last game in 1995. Uh, I had a, you know, one or two serious knee injuries during my career and eventually... Uh, in 95 I played my last match I still I tried for two years to, to train hard and get back playing again but it just you know eventually I just had to accept the fact that that was it over so I was 29 30 I think 30 at the time and uh, football in terms nowadays is quite young, quite young you know? yes, and I, in all honesty I didn't know what I was going to do it wasn't like I planned to, to stop playing it at 30. So the next best thing I suppose for a football player is to look towards coaching and management so I did a little bit of hearts while I was trying to get back from that injury and then I went across to Livingston with Jim Leishman for a while. I was uh, going to say, he's another guy at the back in early as well, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and I learned a lot of things that I shouldn't do working under Jim, you know. I can imagine. <laughs> did, you, did you know that he scored a winning goal against uh, Listen, I've Rangers? Heard, I've, I've heard every story he's got to tell. Exactly. I, half I, a dozen everybody, it's, I, I, I have a tape of that. <laughs> and sometimes when I can't sleep, I put that tape on, you know what I mean? And, and Jim's droning away in the back. Anyway, after a year, years of hard work at your football, your how does it feel to my manager of Scotland? Well, that's yeah. the proudest thing that's ever happened to me, you know. I was lucky enough to play for Scotland and I played in the World Cup in, in Italy in uh, 1990 which was just an amazing experience and you know, one of the biggest things that, that I'd love to do as a manager is, is get a chance to, to take Scotland to another major tournament because it's been so long since we, we've been there but that, it's just it's hard to explain the, the, the feelings of anybody who's a, who's a Scotsman and immensely proud of being Scottish to get the opportunity to manage the, the national team is just a, an amazing thing. 
as some people, I mean, I'm, I'm trying not to be too cynical here, but some people will use the international scene as a short window. But there will be the biggest majority, I would think, would, uh, would be play, play for play for the heart and play for the badge, you know. Um, do, you, do you feel, an ex you obviously feel an extra special feeling when you when you get a, put a Scottish strip on and, I mean, you'll yeah, give 110% plus. When you, walk, you when you walk out as a player, and I mean, I remember walking out, two, two as a player, two big games. The first one was my debut against Argentina at Hamden. Um, it was just unbelievable, you know, to walk out at Hamden because, you know, as a kid, you're always watching cup finals and, and uh, been along to, you know, um, a couple of the sort of home international games against against England at mm -hmm. Hamden as a, as a laddie watching and uh, you always imagine yourself don't you out there having an opportunity to do that so you know that was an amazing thing with debut men playing in the World Cup I mean, uh, I mean the hairs in the back of your neck stand up and the, mm -hmm. the supporters are singing Flower of Scotland and uh, it's just it's difficult to put into words you know. So what would be your, your most favourite game you've ever played in? The game in uh, Genoa for you know in the World Cup in, mm -hmm. in 1990 Played Sweden. I only played in the one game. I, I wasn't selected for the first game, and we we lost to Costa Rica in the first game, one nothing. And then we played uh, Sweden in the second game. I played in that game. We won two one, and I got a little injury, a thigh injury, and, and I missed the Brazil game, unfortunately. Yes. Which would have been so the amazing. game that Gordon Strachan put his leg up in the barrier after he no, scored. No, no, no. I'm not as old as. As you know, I don't think so. <laughs> I still wonder how he got his leg that high because he's just a wee guy, isn't he? <laughs> what was your biggest setback or disappointment, and, and, and how did you overcome anything like that? Was it an injury or your? Yeah, of course. I mean, I, I, I was out as a 20, I think it was 20, 1990, so 1985, uh, my first knee injury, and at that time I was, you know, I was going uh, uh, playing really well and you know, on the, the young Scottish Player of the Year two years in a row. And there was a couple of teams that made offers for me to go. You know, one was Tottenham and Liverpool. And uh, I, I got the injury. And at the time, it was a cruciate knee injury. And at the time, there wasn't an awful lot of people yes. had that type of injury. So I didn't really know what was wrong. I spent six months trying to get back playing yes. before I realised I had something serious wrong. So mm -hmm. I got back playing in, I think, around about 87, but I only played you know, a couple of games and broke down again. And it wasn't really until 1989 that I got back. Mm -hmm playing on a regular basis. With the amount of money that's in football now, especially in the English Premiership, I, I, I take it the medical um, horizons have moved on where maybe your injury would have been spotted. What kind of analysis the players get these days? Uh, they get scanned now if they've got an ingrown toenail. You know? I mean, it, the, the, amount, the, the advancement in the medical side of things has been incredible. When I played, if you got an x-ray, it was unusual. You had to have a really serious injury before they even sent you for an x-ray. But there's, there's all types of there's ultrasound scans, there's... CT scans, or that, you know, there's just so many different things that, that they can do nowadays to help you back. When I got my operation, it was an experimental thing that, that lasted for six months and it broke down. But the second one, it was a year almost. Mm -hmm. Now players are back playing from crucius in six months. The sort of treatment at the time that I got it was you, your, your leg went into a brace for three months so that you didn't move. Now they get it, they've got you up on your feet the day after the op, you know, so that just the, the knowledge, the medical knowledge has improved greatly. I mean, you must have played with some fantastic, give me sort of five players that you'll never ever forget being involved with. It's difficult, I, I find it really difficult to pick, like, best players, because I've got an appreciation that every position is different, you know, and generally when people talk about great players, they talk about strikers scoring goals, you know, and uh, the uh, defensive players for me are... No. You know, I've got. I've been Should a defender me. myself. Should you know, me. I mean, uh, we're lucky in Scotland for a long time to have guys like, so, you know, Willie Miller and Alec McLeish and uh, Alan Hansen, Richard Goff, you know, Roy Aiken, uh, Dave McPherson was in at the time. You know, I, I was starting as well, and then with Colin Henry come over. A lot of really, really good uh, defenders, and maybe one of the things that we don't have so many good players in that area just now. Um, so there was loads of guys who I thought were, were top class defensively. Like at that, at that time, uh, you, you noticed a big difference from playing club football and then you went to the training, you know, with, uh, with the international team. And the first squad I was in was in 1983 or four, we went to Israel and it was, you know, it was guys like Charlie Nicholas and that one, Kenny Delish and, you know, Graham Souness and, you know, the big, big, Players. Are you still in contact with, with some of these guys? Just Most of the guys I keep in touch with are guys I was obviously I was playing with at, uh, at Hearts. You know, you're, um, so yeah, I still have friendships Aye. and go way back to was, sort of my days. When I when I followed football when I was younger, the other teams had have had at least one or maybe two hard men. 
did, was there anybody in the game that, that you sort of kept an eye on and thought oh, I better watch yeah. myself here, keep myself right? I, I used to just keep away for the hard uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, There doesn't seem to be so many of these days. You can't, I mean, the game's changed enormously. Uh, when, when I played, a lot of stuff went on, on off the ball. You know, you, people, little scraps here and there, and vendettas running for game to game yeah. because, you know, as long as the, the linesman didn't see you, you could get away with anything. But, but, but all the TV cameras now. And the game's changed, it's been led from the top where you're set Blatter and uh, Michel Platini. Mm. They've outlawed tackles for the back, you know, like, you know, if you tackle aggressively you'll get booked. Considering you're no longer done you know, how, did, how did you feel when, when you seen them win the cup last year? Oh, I was amazing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was absolutely gutted, you know, that I wasn't there. Aye. When I went to the United, they were, were adrift at the bottom of the league. Yeah. And, you know, the re- one of the reasons that I went there was because of Eddie Thompson, you know, he was a fantastic man. And one of the saddest things for me was that Eddie would, had, had died the year previous to, to the cup man, but I, I just found a, a really special club. Got on really well with the people there, you know, worked extremely hard to, you know, to try and turn things around and sign mm-hmm. some good players and bring some young players in. And it was, the culmination was winning the, the cup. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's, it's very difficult when Scotland come calling to say, look, you know, I didn't want to come just now, I want to wait until the end of the season. So uh, there was no choice for me, I had to leave and, and, uh, and take the Scotland job. But I'm so happy for the, the supporters and everybody mm-hmm. attached. But, but I'm being honest, I'm jealous, you know, because I was jealous. Of the year, right? How do you think the score's shaping up for the future? Not just the, future, the first and the next two of them in the European Championship, but in the next 10 years, say, do you, do you I'm really encouraged, you know. I, I, even in the last year, you know, there's been so many players who, who I feel have kind of pushed themselves to the front of the, mm-hmm. the queue. I mean, there's, uh, I'm down in England now, just to, to give you an example. Four years ago, we had two players playing in the Premiership in England. Uh, Dan Fletcher played for Manchester United and James McFadden. And now there's 15. You know, we've got 15 players uh, playing in the Premiership in England, and, and what that means is that there's 15 players who are playing week in, week out okay, against yes. international class players. Yes. So for me to put them into an international game is quite easy. That tells you something. And a lot of these guys are, are younger. You know, Graham Dorans and, and James Morrison at West Brom, Charlie Adam, who's just been amazing. You know, he really has been. I see Dan Fletcher still doing doing his bit. Still a young lad as well, really. Yeah, he's still, still, he's still sort of fairly young boy. We've got Craig Gordon and Phil Bardsley, uh, who are week in, week out, the two, two of the best players in the, mm. uh, in the Sunderland team. Yeah. But uh, Gary Caldwell playing every week at, uh, at Wigan, Alan, ha- Alan Hutton, who's had an amazing season. At, uh, Fantastic, yeah. You start to look through it all, you say, so wait a minute, there's, you know, there's some really good players here. I really am encouraged by you know, them and out of course we've got guys like Sir Naismith who's had an amazing time at Ranger recently and, and Whitaker's improved at all recognition as well. So when you start to add them up, we're not far away from having a yeah. whole new group of players who are, who are ready to play at the national football. It's confidence is a great confidence, thing, you yeah. know, and yeah. it's hard to it's hard to give you know, I wish you could give somebody an injection, you know, so there's but it doesn't work that way, it's about you know, experience and, and uh, <coughs> learning how to learning how to win. You know, as I say, the, the better class players that you've got, as you've already alluded to, then the better chance you've got of winning matches. Mm-hmm. After that, it's the manager's job to create, you know, this kind of winning mentality and team spirit. And you know, that's something that we're, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been encouraged about as well. That we've got great examples in the in the team, the guys who are winners and, and run and run and run to the drop to, to do well for Scotland. Yeah. And I think it might be old fashioned, but I think that's important when you're playing for your country. Well, we were speaking before the then we started about the, the, the SBL and the top 10 teams, top 12, top 16. And uh, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, I know it's, it's ongoing, it's still up well, for I, debate, you know. I've got, I've got pretty clear thoughts on it because I'm not as such a, a supporter, I mean, I'm not watching all of the teams in the SPL week in and week out. I'm not buying a season ticket. And I know that some people are exasperated because they'd like to see more variety. But I have one concern, one concern only, and that is the quality of players that are available for Scotland. And there's absolutely no doubt that you produce better quality players when you when players play with and against good players. I've, I've watched a lot of games last season when I was at Dundee United as a manager and, and I think, in my opinion, if we if we have first league of 10, then you have the 10 best teams in the league. Mm-hmm. So there should be concentrated quality in the top 10. Okay, there's still going to be a bit of a gap between the old firm and you know, the ones down the bottom. 
But there's no doubt that if you want to perform at the best level, then you, you have to have your best players playing against your best players. Might be not what some <laughs> supporters want to hear because their views will be different, but for me to produce top quality players, they need to be playing in meaningful competitive matches every week. So I agree, with, I agree with that saying of the top class players, but I often think that there's no uh, much opportunity for really young and upcoming players getting a wee break and getting a wee game, you know, because it's... John, that's got more to do with money. That. Young players, if you look at historically, young players get a chance when clubs are struggling for money. When they've got money, and I, I, you know, I experienced that when I just at the time when I was leaving Hearts, there was an influx, a lot of foreign players to Hearts who were getting fortunes, you know. And because of that, all the young players, you know, start to struggle to get in, so you have to be exceptional to get in. The other thing that, that's evident about young players getting the game is the manager you've got. Yeah. Some managers just won't play, you know, they, they believe in playing experienced players. So people say that, you know, that it's all about being able to bring players into matches that are, that are less pressure. I, I, I think that's untrue. Mm -hmm. I think that if you're going to be a top player, you have to learn to handle pressure from day one. We've got a, a sort of open forum there. We're wondering if, if everybody, there's a few other people with questions, if you could open yeah, up and see, see what we think. I've got a question, Craig. You had twice been banned in your career. One was for an unfortunate incident at Stark Spark, 1994, Graham Hogg. But what was the other one? I, can't, I don't know. You need to. <laughs> <laughs> I can certainly remember the Graham Hogg one, but I would rather not talk <clears> about that. That's a bit of passion. That's, <laughs> that's what Scottish football needs, is a bit of passion. There's nothing wrong with that, you know? No, no, no listen, I've, I've talked about that at length in the past. Oh. It's something I regret, you know. I mean, I, you, know, you don't want to see that type of thing happen on the, the football field. I'm trying to think of what the other situation I got banned for. I mean, I, uh, I think I was uh, sending off like when Junior Hearts clear. Uh, you know, I, I, as, a, as a football player, you, you, you get banned on loads of occasions because you, you reach the points, you know, once you get sending off, you, you get an automatic one game ban for that. And if you accumulate points, then obviously you're out again for, so I've been banned quite a few times, but um, no, just uh, they're just in the sort of normal course of the game and the points adding up to whatever the points threshold is and then you miss a game or two games or whatever it is. Mr. Levine, you obviously got a lot of pressure being in Scotland manager. How do you cope with it? Well, look at my grey hair. I don't cope very well, eh? <laughs> 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 uh, I haven't been a manager at Hearts, a big club, and uh, I was at Leicester for a while and Dundee United. You know, I'm, I'm used to the pressure that comes along with being a, a football manager. But what I found uh, you know, really unbelievable was the amount of intensity involved in the Scottish international games. Because what happens is the whole thing shuts down, all the club football shuts down, so you've got all these press guys who have nothing to do for two weeks other than follow Scotland. And uh, I mean, I found that uh, pretty difficult at first, just to get a handle on just how intense the, the, the media yeah. party was. But, you know, I've, I've had quite a few games now and I'm, I'm a little bit more relaxed. You're getting used to it. <laughs> I'm getting used to it now, yeah. The skin's getting a bit thicker, that's what you're saying. Well, it has to be, doesn't it? You know, I mean, in this job, that, that I mean, everybody can do your job better than you. That's football, isn't it? You know, everybody's of got course. their opinion and of everybody course. thinks that, you know, you should have done this and you should have done that. But the, the, one of the reasons that you know, I got the job was because people obviously thought that what I'd done in previous jobs was was good enough to, of course, to take the Scotland job. So I, I'm a great believer in doing what I think is right. Ultimately, all I want is success for Scotland. So. I'll do everything I can and do what I think is right. To, mm -hmm. you know, to and I'm sure you'll get it. Well, I, I hope you're right. You know, I'm, I'm certainly more uh, yeah. more confident uh, now, as I said to you, with the quality of players that are coming through. How do you relax when you're not uh, on your bed? Um, well, that's, that's a good question. How do I relax? I mean, the yeah. funny thing is that even when I you know, even when I'm relaxing, I tend to be thinking about football, whether it be... Well, you know, a bit like me, so you know, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you're better suited the job than I am, I think. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I like, I like playing golf occasionally, you know, and uh, I've got a couple of dogs, and I like, you know, going out and mm. going for a walk, trying to clear my head. Football's the type of game that, that engulfs you, you know, you, it's hard to get away from thinking about it. What's your opinion on, on like, goal line technology? I, I get annoyed, you know, when we, we get too caught up in, in, in uh, you know, this is the way it's always been, so we've got to stick with it, you know. And, uh, you know, the, the biggest group of people who benefit from goal line technology are referees. Mm -hmm. right. You know, the referees never want to make a mistake. Nobody wants to make a mistake, and they don't... The last thing a referee wants to see is the ball has actually gone over the line and he hasn't given the goal. So, something as simple as goal line technology, where it's straightforward, not worried about, you know, 
seven or eight or nine replays, I think it's fairly straightforward if the ball's crossed the line or not. And, they, and you know, I, I think that the UEFA have been pretty stubborn in not bringing this in. But you know, I think after the England situation in the World Cup, and, but not just that, the England situation, nineteen sixty six as well. Uh, you, know, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I feel that it's a no brainer. We should, we should be using the technology that's available. A lot of people have been doing a debate: Messi or Ronaldo. Messi. My, my fa favourite or most exciting attacking footballer I've ever seen was Maradona. And yeah. I actually now believe that Messi is a better player than Maradona. So that tells you how much I think. It's got to be low centre of gravity and movement and all that kind of thing. It's, as well, he's just amazing, isn't he? Aye. You know, both of them are, to be fair. Now, one of the things that probably that Messi <coughs> puts him above Maradona is that he manages to have all of this talent but a really kind of grounded sensible head on him, you know, whereas Mar Maradona we know was right. up, to t up to two or three other things, but Messi's just a kid, he seems so mature. What type of music do you listen to? Just oh dear. What happens is, I listen to just about anything, but my daughter makes me up some CDs, it's got loads of stuff on it, some of the stuff's hers and it's rubbish to be honest <laughs> with her. Um, and I just listen, honestly, I just listen to absolutely anything. I tend to listen to music uh, in the car, you know, if I'm, if I do a lot of travelling down to England and if I'm not on the phone, uh, I've got the hands free, I must say, before the day start panicking, but, you know, if I'm not on the phone, uh, then I listen to music and it's just, I've got so many, just a wide range. I see, like, you're not a typical week for you, what would you be doing? I mean, I'm away this, this week, um, I've got, uh, I'm going for here, I've got four DVDs I need to watch of Northern Ireland. So I'll do that over the next two days. It's not just a matter of watching the DVD. I, you know, I've got to cut it down and, and you know, pick out the bits that are relevant. So I can, when the players, when we get the players together for this game, I can show them how Northern Ireland are going to play and what we have to do to, you know, to beat them. So that that's about the next two days. I'm, I'm doing that. Friday night, I'm going driving down to Wolverhampton uh, to Birmingham. Sorry, I'm watching two games in Birmingham on Saturday. I'm staying overnight in Birmingham on Saturday. Going from Birmingham to Blackburn game on Sunday. I'm meeting. Uh, Ian Holloway on, on Monday morning, Bolton game on Monday night, I'm meeting Stevie Keane on Tuesday and then I'm at uh, either Wigan or Blackpool on uh, Tuesday night and then back home on Wednesday. If you look at the football calendar there's games on just about every day of the week you know? and if I'm not doing that I'll be, I'll be in a Hamden catching up with paperwork and some pieces so keep myself busy. Do you prefer healthy diet? Uh, I have been. <laughs> I, 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 I confess that my diet up to about six months ago was, or three, three or four months ago, wasn't great. Uh, too, too many uh, motorway service stations, you know. I've been trying to behave myself. And, and they cost a bomb as well for you. Yeah, they do. They do. Just out of curiosity, when is the next Scotland game anyway? February the 9th, we play, uh, we play Northern Ireland in Dublin. I'd like to just call the halt there. I've got to thank uh, Craig Levine, Scotland Manager, on behalf of the Radio West 5 Sports team, myself, John Matson, and other Johns, and David, and Annette. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and thank you, Craig, for coming. I appreciate no, it. And uh, I hope and everybody uh, who's listening, uh, whatever their ailments are, um, <coughs> get better very quickly.